11 minutes before 11, should the death penalty be reinstated? What do you think? 011-883-0702. Have your say in Johannesburg on that number. And if you are in Cape Town, dial us on 021-446-0567. I thought the matter was dead and buried, but the South African Institute of Race Relations had been asked to have a look into whether or not um, it is worth, uh, you know, opening up this debate, reintroducing the death penalty. Um, it concluded that the death penalty should not be reintroduced as, quote, human beings who are not infallible ought not to choose a form of punishment which is irreferable. But I want to know from you what your sentiment is around this. Joining me for this debate, I've got a couple of folks on the line. Firstly, let's welcome Professor Pierre DeFoss, who's constitutional law lecturer at UCT. Uh, Pierre, long time, no chat. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes, it's a pleasure, and uh, thank you for having me. And also on the line, Director of Christian View Network is Philip uh, Rosenthal. Philip, thanks so much for agreeing to come on the show as well. Hi there. I'm going to start firstly with you, Pierre. Um, you know, I often regard the matter settled. State versus Makonyana had the final say. Before we even delve into the arguments... How do you feel about this debate even being opened up? <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit like having to argue, for example, about whether racism is a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, it's so obvious to me um, <laughs> that it is, uh, you know, that it's untenable. Also, as a constitutional lawyer, of course, because if we're going to bring back the death penalty, we would have to take away some of the rights. We would have to amend the Bill of Rights and take away some of those rights, which is almost never a good idea. Um, and it's not going to happen. It would need a two-thirds majority in Parliament. So it's not going to happen, um, no matter what people say, because the Constitution prohibits it, and it's not going to be changed. So why did you bother with your rather nuanced blog entry on the matter if it is a legal fait accompli? Mm. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know, actually. I, maybe I was bored <laughs> with, uh, with Karin Gordon and the minister of, um, and the president and all that. Um, and I was intrigued that it was brought up again. And uh, the thing that always interests me is exactly the fact that when people talk about the death penalty, they talk about it as if it is going to stop crime, as if it's going to be a deterrent. While all the evidence suggests that it is never a deterrent, because uh, as the Constitutional Court said, what is a deterrent for crime is really that people will be apprehended, uh, people who commit serious crimes will be apprehended, they will be prosecuted, and they will be convicted. But only 10% of those people who, are, who have committed murder are ever apprehended, prosecuted, and convicted. So most people who commit murder, for example, do it because they think they're never going to be caught. And so I can't imagine that it is a deterrent. So I thought that was maybe a little bit of an interesting argument. Okay, Philip, let me jump in there. I don't know which arguments you have up your sleeve. Pierre has dived into the deterrence part of this debate. What are the reasons why you are in favor of the death penalty being reinstated? And then we'll puzzle through them. Okay, well, firstly, I would uh, say just in terms of this issue of the Bill of Rights uh, needing amendment, uh, we fully understand that we need to do that and we support that idea. I put in a submission to the uh, Constitutional Assembly uh, before it was uh, passed in 1996, uh, arguing this death penalty needed to be clarified in the Constitution, and I think that there's uh, more reason now to do so. Just to correct this statistic slightly, that 10% refers to, 1 in 10 refers to after a period of two years on an individual case. Uh, it's uh, more like 1 in 6 on a, uh, off in the long term, and then if you take into account that murderers will usually repeat murder, uh, eventually the chances of being caught is much higher, but they'll kill more people in the process. Uh, now then, to correct the issue of deterrent, I looked at the statistics. If you're just looking about whether the country has uh, the death penalty legal or not, um, you, that can be a difficult issue to argue. But if you look at the number of executions that they are doing versus the, the rate of murder, you will see that the uh, top 15 countries that have, we are the 15th country in the world for murder. Uh, if you look at the top 15 countries for execution, uh, the, none of the same countries are on that same list as the top murder rate. Uh, 
Uh, and if you also compare countries that are near to each other, that have a similar sort of society, you will see that um, you know, our neighbors, for example, Zimbabwe and Botswana have uh, the death penalty. They have uh, a much lower murder rate. Uh, and the same is true with other countries that are next to each other if you compare with and without uh, this execution rate. So I think that the – but one doesn't need to execute every single murderer to make the difference. Uh, one only needs to execute a very small fraction of them to make the difference. Uh, then one also has to look at the issue that the pro – death penalty people have been incrementally trying to reduce the number of executions since 1935 uh, so that there was actually very few happening just leading up to the uh, <clears throat> the transition period um, and that skews the statistics a little bit so i think that overall the statistics show that where executions happen it is an effective deterrent let's puzzle through that a bit philip I mean, are you not confusing your cause and correlation? It may also be true that in countries where you have low murder rates and a death penalty, for all we know, you might find that a lot of people eat jungle oats in the morning and they don't do so in countries where you have high murder rates. In other words, the correlation doesn't prove the cause. How do you not know, for example, that in certain parts of the Middle East where you might have the death penalty and low murder rates, that there are co-explanatory factors like the value system, maybe less inequality than in South Africa. Uh, you have less inequality in South Africa than some of our neighboring countries. So how, how do you determine what the single explanandum is for the low murder rate? Or are you just helping yourself to a conclusion that helps your side? Um, look, we can spend more time on that question, but I think we have to keep our answers short in this particular debate because time is limited and I would <clears throat> bring in further the argument that the, the polls have shown that uh, <clears throat> three quarters of South Africans want the death penalty uh, reinstated of whatever... No, 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 hold on, hold on, yeah. Philip. We've got all the time on this show and if we okay. need to come back to, 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 to thresh out the other issues properly, we can do so. So let's okay. take it one step at a, at a time. You said X leads to Y. I'm asking you how do you know it's not A or B or C that leads to Y? In other words, it could be the value system. It could be the general respect for the law. There are so many other potential explanations. How do you know that the singular and overriding explanation in the countries that you've cited is the presence of the death penalty? That's a burden you have to discharge for that argument to be sustained. Okay, well, it's, it's one of the arguments. There are other factors that we'll, are relevant. We'll get For to example, the others. We see a lower in industrialized countries, such as Europe, one sees a, a lower murder rate in general, uh, and that is, that is a factor in the thing. But I'm just saying if you, com if you compare on this list some of the countries that are near to each other, uh, just you can go, any of the listeners can go on to uh, nationmaster.com and look at the statistics and, uh, and, and verify that and, and debate the matter. But one would have to, uh, to yes, do a more detailed statistical study uh, to try and equalize these uh, and make allowance for these matters. Um, but I think that Mr. DeForce will want to bring across some, some legal arguments, and I'm also happy to, to rebut those. Uh, no, those that's fine, but, yeah, yeah we, 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 we flag every issue uh, fully. Mm. Pierre, let me give you a chance. The, the, the correlation argument in 30 seconds, yeah. what is your perspective on it? Well, statistics is always very difficult because it's, very, it's not easy to make the correlation. But if you look at South Africa, because we, we are talking about South Africa, when the death penalty was abolished in 1995, uh, the murder rate was 67 per 100,000. Uh, in 2014, it was 33 uh, per 100,000. So it is almost halved. So the, the, the abolition of the death penalty led to a halving of the murder rate. So there might, there might be other reasons. I'm not saying there's a yeah. correlation there. I'm just okay. saying that mm. okay. you can't really make the argument. That, okay. that Either way. Okay. Okay. Wait, guys, let's just take a quick break. Philip, I'm going to give you a chance. When the day starts, you don't put on a badge and gun or get into a car with flashing lights. But that doesn't mean you can't be a crime-fighting hero. When you report a crime with Crimeline, it's 100% anonymous. So put on your Crimeline mask and be one of the faceless heroes. Send your anonymous tip-offs to 32211 or crimeline.co.za. Crimeline, your independent crime tip-off service. SMS is charged at one rand. Clubcard members. 
Remember, every time you swipe your Clix Club card, your money goes further. Because with every swipe, you earn cash back every two months. Your next cash back loads 23 November, just in time for Christmas. So you can stock up on your favorite health, home, and beauty products and a Christmas gift or treat. Join today and feel the benefits. Clix. Feel good. Pay less. Cape Talk and Fergenoog Wine Estate in Stellenbosch present the brand new Live at Fergenoog Summer Concert Series. Featuring iconic SA musicians Art Matthews, Arno Carstens, Matthew Mole and more every first Sunday until April. Sunday 4th December features the talented Art Matthews. Hey, this is Art Matthews. Live music, beverages, food and great company all set on Fergenoog's idyllic green lawns. 120 rand for adults, 50 rand for under 12s with a dedicated kids area. Tickets at web tickets. For more info visit capetalk.coza. It's not too late to book a dream summer holiday with Cape Nature. Rejuvenate yourself or join up with family and discover terrific new experiences. Our nature reserves are the ideal destination to explore the great outdoors. Cape Nature has a holiday package for everyone across our nature reserves. To book, call 021-483-0190 or visit capenature.coza. T's and C's apply. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore. Experience. We're going to continue our debate on the death penalty after the news. It's one minute after 11. Let's check in. Here's the very latest in Eyewitness News. This is Eyewitness News. Good morning. I'm Aurelie Kalinga. Finance Minister Previn Gordon says talking about economic growth is futile if it doesn't translate into the daily lives of citizens. Gordon was giving a briefing on the country's message ahead of the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland in January. The theme for next year is responsive and responsible leadership. Zianda Ngobo reports. Kevin Gordon, who remained adamant that he would not respond to questions on the ANC-NEC meeting, says societies are growing increasingly frustrated due to a lack of economic development and social progress. Talking alone is not uh, good enough. It is when citizens experience positive change, when they see... ...in their life situation or in their work situation that they know that change has come. Gordon says the discussion at next year's World Economic Forum will focus on deepening inclusive development. And the absence of innovative and credible steps increases the likelihood of a downward spiral in the global economy fueled by protectionism, populism and nativism. The finance minister says the Treasury will be engaging with the metros to discuss growth and how they manage their finances. Zian Dangobo, Eyewitness News, Four Ways. SARS says it's exceeded its target of 1 trillion rand in revenue from income tax for the 2015-2016 financial year. The Revenue Service released the ninth edition of the Tax Statistics Bulletin in Pretoria today, which provides an overview of revenue collection for the year. SARS Executive Randall Carlison says while they exceeded their target, revenue also grew. And so we exceeded the target by roughly 200 million, which is 0.02%. We grew year on year by 8.5%, uh, which was quite significant given the low growth economic environment that we found ourselves in. He says growth in personal income tax has made up for a decline in company income tax. CIT reduced in its contribution to the overall tax basket to just under 20%. And that slack was basically taken up by PIT. PIT grew last year by 10% and its relative contribution is 35%. Ten children have been injured in a car crash in Bremsig, west of Johannesburg, this morning. It's understood the driver of the minibus they were traveling in lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a wall. Paramedics say all the children have been transported to the Leratong Hospital where they're being treated. Authorities say they were from a special needs school. ER24 spokesperson Russell Mehring says the driver suffered serious injuries. Rescue services had to use the jaws of life equipment to free the man from the vehicle. He sustained serious injuries and was transported in a stable condition to Laratong Hospital. Fortunately, none of the, the children were seriously injured. All the injuries sustained were uh, ranged from minor to moderate. Moving to Colombia, rescue operations at the site of a plane crash have been suspended amid heavy rain. Authorities were looking for survivors after the aircraft with 81 people aboard went down this morning. The Chapaquese Brazilian football team was among the passengers of the flight, which took off from Bolivia. The team were due to play in the final of the South American Cup in Medellin tomorrow. 
And Thailand's parliament has invited Crown Prince Vajira Longkorn to be the new king of the country. This completes the formal process for the successor to take the throne following the death of his father last month. The prince will now have to accept parliament's invitation in order for him to be proclaimed king. The prince has not spoken publicly since his father's death. Gold is trading at one thousand one hundred ninety-one dollars twenty-one an ounce. The rand's at thirteen eighty-four to the dollar, seventeen sixteen to the pound, fourteen sixty-five to the euro. Brent crude oil is at forty-seven dollars seventy-two a barrel. Traffic remains heavily backed up on the R24 west up between Isando and the Galulis interchange due to a stationary truck. We have bumper to bumper traffic in Salby on the M2 west between Joslova Drive and Main Reef Road, and in Cape Town roadworks are slowing down traffic on the N1 inbound after Durban Road. Gauteng's weather is fine, highs ranging between 33 and 36 degrees. Clear skies in Cape Town with a fresh southerly wind, temperatures peaking at 25 degrees. The top story in Eyewitness News this hour. Finance Minister Pravin Gordon says talking about economic growth is futile if it does not translate to the daily lives of citizens. Eyewitness News. In touch, in tune and independent. For the latest, visit ewn.co.za. Know your rights. Use them responsibly. Lead SA. The Reedy Clavy Show with Eusebius Mackaiser. Cape Talk. Your number one news and talk station. Six minutes after 11, we're debating the death penalty. Should it be reinstated or should it remain dead and buried? What do you think? 011-883-0702. Have your say in Johannesburg and in Cape Town on the number 21 Double four six zero five six seven. You can put your own view, your own arguments, reflections, or you can engage the arguments as you are hearing them from my two guests, constitutional law expert, lecturer, and commentator, Professor Pierre de Foss and Philip Rosenthal, who is director, Christian View Network. There are a number of other arguments, Pierre and Philip, I'd like us to puzzle through. Can we call it a truce on the stats argument, or do either of you want to claim victory or make a rejoinder? Philip? I just would just like to question the statistic about the murder rate coming down. Firstly, that there was a massive pol- run of political murders around the transition period, which might have skewed that statistic. Secondly, Interpol is questioning the reporting of our murder rate. Um, and thirdly, I think that all of us uh, can talk to uh, people who are older and they will say that things were much safer previously. I know that things were much safer when they were when I was younger. Uh, when has just in the last week uh, six policemen in the Western Cape, Cape who've been shot, uh, gangsters, used to be afraid of the police. Now even the military are afraid of the gangsters. The gangsters are, st- are stealing military weapons from, uh, from uh, them. There's uh, problems that we used to chase criminals in the street and shout stop thief. Now we can't do that anymore because the criminals are not afraid of us or the police. Uh, these armed responses and electric fences, we didn't need them in the old days. Okay, I but can we agree then on this, you. Philip, that even if what you are saying is true, let's say I force Pierre to accept what you've just said for argument's sake as true, the most we can conclude would be that it is inconclusive what difference the death penalty might make to crime stats. Do you accept that that is the most that one can conclude on that I argument think we alone? We can debate the question of the death penalty itself, but I think when it's enforced and there's a, a, a high number of, of executions that makes a very big difference. And I think that that you can see from the international stats. No, but you refuse to engage my yeah. very fair question about co-explanatory factors for low crime levels in countries that have it. By your own admission, one would have to do further work. I didn't forget okay. what I asked you eight minutes before 11, Philip. Okay, well, when, well I, I cited some examples of countries that are pretty close to each other, but yes, one could do further debate, and I think that that's uh, not something we can do uh, okay. on, on air at the moment. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the second issue. On, on Pierre, to be like fair that. on Philip, I want yeah. to also play devil's advocate with the liberal position because the truth yeah. is my own personal position coincides with yours. But I've looked at your blog and a couple of parts of your blog I really loved. But I think the weakest argument for you and for folks like me is on the vengeance question and the word vengeance is a lovely dirty word but of course the proper word is retributive justice surely liberals or anyone who holds the position that it happened shouldn't be reinstated should give greater time and thought to how serious that Mm. argument is the idea that the death penalty is an expression of 
deep moral and social disapproval of heinous crimes. Now, set aside the deterrence question for the moment. Surely that argument yeah. is not taken sufficiently seriously. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, devil's advocate. So, the, 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 obviously, the retribution is one of the aims of punishment, criminal punishment. So, I'm not denying that. I, I ac admit and accept that part of punishing people for doing something that is a crime is retribution. It is not only to deter or to rehabilitate or whatever the case might be. But what I would say is there need to be proportionality between these different reasons and the, the, the nature of the punishment and what it is aimed at. Um, and retribution can be done in many different ways. It can be done, for example, by locking somebody up for a very long time. If you have been, uh, if you have committed a serious and a violent, horrible crime in which somebody had suffered or died, then you have to be punished. Part of that is retribution. And that could, could be done in a way that is not going to, firstly, completely extinguish that person's life because there is something for me morally deeply problematic in the state taking for itself the power to kill its citizens. Um, and so I think that is not proportionate to what, uh, there's not a proportionality there between the need for retribution um, and the nature of the... Of but you see, the, this is where the limits of that argument come in. And I'm not just playing devil's advocate here. When, yeah. when I, around the bri, argue against the death penalty, I stay away from the retribution argument because I really think that it's, that it's poor. And even our jurists, uh, you know, there's a limit to how good they are at ethics and moral philosophy, Pierre. The truth of the matter is that you, your, that argument is circular, and it's even circular in State versus Marconiana, because at the point at which you say, I as peer subjectively feel that extinguishing the life of a person is not proportionate, I mean, that's just your gut intuition about the state being involved in ending someone's life, right? I think, uh, well, of course, there's something about it that is my personal opinion, but it so happens also that the, all the values that are contained in the Constitution, the founding document of the country, those values uh, of human dignity, equality, freedom, and so on, I think that it's very difficult to square uh, something like the death penalty with the values that are embodied in that Constitution. So, yes, it so happens that those values are also values that I think are rather important, but I think you can... You can uh, appeal to something that is outside of you, namely the values in the Constitution, which is what the Constitutional Court did and said that if you have a right to life, if you have a, a right to human dignity, a right not to be uh, subjected to cruel and inhuman uh, de and degrading treatment and punishment, then the deterrence arguments seem to be going against the, the very heart of what the constitution of democracy is trying to establish which is a society that actually respects the inherent dignity of every person no matter how horrible that person might be or what horrible things they might have done philip That's i'm going to give you i'm going to philip i'm going to give you a chance in 30 seconds i just want to press pia sure. one last time on this when I read that part of your blog, I thought to myself, but what about countries like the United States? You surely do not think, Pierre, as a constitutional comparative law expert, that the United States is a priori anti-equality, anti-dignity, anti-freedom. So is the truth of the matter not that when it comes specifically to this retribution part of the analysis, we bandy around words in constitutional jurisprudence of Africa, dignity, equality, and freedom, and we almost use them as props to try and avoid the moral complexity of re retribution. I mean, there are first world countries that we regard as decent places from which to borrow liberal jurisprudence that do have the death penalty. I disagree with that, actually. I don't think that the U.S. is a country that is based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. <laughs> I think that, wow. the constitution, <laughs> that the Constitution, as interpreted by the right-wing U.S. constitutional, the Supreme Court, um, is a very problematic uh, document as interpreted by them. It is a 
200-year-old document that has not stood the, stood the test of time and that is not interpreted in a progressive way in accordance with the kind of values that I think any modern constitution should have. So, no, I don't agree with the basic premise of your argument. Wow. Do you know that we've got the audio now permanently, eh? When your American <laughs> colleagues come to visit. Philip, how do you respond to people who say all you want is vengeance and that's sort of like a yucky, a yucky basis for the death penalty? Okay, well, firstly, the word uh, or the issue of vengeance and, and retribution is, are negative words that are, are, I think, being spun here. And generally, that, that applies to when a person has a personal interest, whereas here, yeah, this, uh, this is an interest where uh, the state, uh, as mandated by God, um, with the job of, of executing criminals. That is, the, uh, that is, it's clearly spelt out in the Bible, and it's uh, some, a view that's shared by the vast majority of South Africans. Um, I understand that Mr. DeForce has a different viewpoint, um, but that is a, a minority viewpoint. Certainly it's uh, very different to the framers of the United States Constitution, which uh, was the constitution through which most of our other free constitutions are are derived, but I think there's been an evolution of a new viewpoint, in, especially in the legal profession, uh, which is prioritizing the rights of the adult strong individual, mm. uh, definitely not, the, for example, the, the unborn individual, of which we've had executions of 100,000 a year in South Africa, it doesn't seem to worry them, uh, and now pushing, on to the leg- pushing for the, the legalization of euthanasia. Um, we, the, the view of the sanctity of life, which is held by most of South Africa and, and explained in the Bible, is uh, one that uh, sees the state as having a role uh, of administering justice, which includes uh, punishing uh, murderers for, um, <clears throat> with the penalty of death, which is, I think, completely proportional. It's life for life. Okay, let's leave it there for now. We've dealt with deterrence. We have discussed a little bit, um, obviously, the issue of whether it's an appropriate moral expression of our disgust for certain kinds of crimes. Mark, David, and MJ, I'm going to take your calls after this and get Pierre and Philip to also engage our listeners. Kino Cullies, weekday mornings, 6 to 9. Student Somerset West. I was traveling into the city on the N2 this morning. There was a traffic officer's uh, vehicle with two traffic officers that had pulled off a driver. And while the, the male officer was busy filling out the paperwork, the female officer with a, a G.I. Jane haircut was busy giving the driver push-ups behind the, the traffic vehicle. <laughs> so it's a bit of, uh, a bit of on-scene punishment by the look of it. Kino Cummings on Cape Talk, your number one, number one news and talk station. The 1st of December is World AIDS Day. According to the 2016 UN AIDS Gap Report, an estimated 7 million South Africans are living with HIV AIDS. Thanks to SIPLA's affordable triple therapy AIDS, ARVs, millions living with the disease can continue to live a normal life. One in three patients in Africa that are on ARVs are using Sipla products. Sipla continues its efforts to provide quality care for everyone through the Sipla Foundation and their recent hashtag not asking for anything campaign, which invites people and corporations to join in and help those in need. Sipla, advancing health care for all. Is it a gift? It's more than a gift. It's this season's hottest accessory. It's faster charging as well as water and dust resistant for whatever you get up to this summer. It's also the perfect way to capture memories, track your fitness and discover a whole world of virtual reality. I agree. I was just asking if you wanted a gift wrapped. Oh. (laughs) It's more than a gift. It's the Galaxy S7 Edge. Now in blue coral. Samsung. A way of life. Cape Town, don't miss the 23rd annual Carol Boys Charity Open Day Sale at Island Centre in Pardon Island, corner of Pardon Island and Cumberland Roads. Get elegant branded homeware and accessories at discount prices, with a portion of the proceeds going to charity. The Carol Boys Charity Open Day Sale runs on Saturday the 3rd and Monday the 5th of December only, from 8am till 3pm. Get there early. For more information, visit carolboys.com. At Cape Talk, we strive to serve all our listeners. To protect you, we adhere to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission's Code of Conduct. Cape Talk is committed to giving you accurate news, fair comment, and balanced programming, which represents a diversity of views. We ask if in any way we're not living up to this code, you direct a complaint in writing to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission, 
Email bccsa at nabsa.co.za. For more, visit bccsa.co.za. Eusebius Lekaiser on Cape Talk, your number one news and talk station. Call Eusebius on 021. 021- Double four six oh five six. minutes after 11. If you've just tuned in, we are debating the death penalty. Let's go straight to the lines before uh, we wrap it up with one or two uh, f- last rounds of comments from my two wonderful guests, Professor Pierre de Foss, constitutional law expert, and Philip Rosenthal, who is the director of the Christian View Network. Mark and Centurion, welcome to the debate, Mark. Hi, you see this. Um, thanks very much. Look, I don't think the government should be given the mandate to implement the death penalty. I don't trust the state. They can't even get basic education right now. You want them to kill people legally. It's just too easy to open up to abuse. There are better ways to manage crime, and that's by training your police force and having an efficient criminal justice system, not by implementing the death penalty. If criminals know they're going to get caught, they're not going to do it. Not that they know they might get caught and they might get hung. Hmm. Good point, and uh, that was uh, Pierre's opening salvo. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for calling in. Eh? Much appreciated. Yep. Cheers. Let's go to Midrand. Hello, David. Uh, yes, yes, how are you, my brother? I'm very good, David. What is your attitude towards the death penalty? Yeah, yes, yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear, the nation awaits your wisdom. Yes, uh, a very interesting topic you guys uh, have raised. Uh, in fact, I've been waiting for you to raise it so that we can put it down for good, you see, yes. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not very good with English, so please uh, bear with me, okay? Now, uh, the death penalty uh, debate. Look, this thing is not going to work in this country. For one simple reason, you see, yes. Uh, our country is a highly racial country. We are living with people who are incredibly racist. And in most cases, you will find that those very people are the ones who are pushing for this uh, uh, death penalty. Now, this thing is working, is working through court, uh, you see, yes. If... If, if uh, the rich can afford these lawyers who can maneuver their way out of any crime, the black man is not going to be able to afford those lawyers to get them out of the crosshairs of the death penalty. So this is going to be very effective on the black, poor majority who cannot afford mm. the death lawyers. Now, if you want to talk about prevention, this thing is very simple. Let those who have share the wealth with those who do not have, because at the end of the day, most crimes happen because of people who do not have robbing those who have. Let's share the wealth. Let's share the land. Let's share the mineral wealth. This is a highly beautiful country, highly very rich. Let's share and stop racializing things. Now, if, for example, you see, yes, we are stuck in the past, uh, there's 60 of us in there. Only 10 of you guys have uh, a dozen apples. Now, what do you think is going to happen in that situation? We are starving here. So those who have the apples are going to be in danger because those who do not have any apples are hungry and they're going to attack uh, to get those apples there. Rather, cut the apples and let's share and then prevent a a very deadly situation. I see this as a way of just killing black people, seriously, because uh, you can see even uh, uh, daily on 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 those news there that uh, 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 white people are are, are affording the best lawyers. They can get Mm -hmm. themselves out of this uh, very, very, very uh, unjust system, which we call the justice system. David? uh, my brother, yes. There's nothing wrong with your English and your logic is impeccable. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you very much for listening to me, Eusebia. And I'm enjoying your show, brother. Cheers, my man. Appreciate it. Let's take one last caller. MJ in Kempton Park. Good morning. Good morning to you, CBS, and to your guests. Thank you for taking my call. I just have a quick question for Philip. And it's with regards to the wrongful convictions of capital punishment Mm-hmm. Um, I just read an article that was published in 2014 that in the United States alone, almost 4% of um, capital punishment sentences are, wrong, are because of wrongful accusation. Um, I mean, even if it's 1%, mm. all right? My question is, you can never bring back someone to life, you know? And unless your Philip can prove that all um, legal systems are foolproof and that they're not prone to human error, maybe you might consider hmm. uh, capital punishment, but um, th- that's my position. Okay. Yeah. Philip, let's puzzle through a couple of those. The first issue, the possibility of wrongful convictions, particularly in a criminal justice system that is imperfect, surely that is a reality that your principled arguments must also be able to respond to. Yeah, well, 
in terms of the, uh, the the Bible's position on the subject, it says, look, the uh, the cases when capital punishment can only be applied when there uh, when there is uh, more than one witness that is, uh, to the event. Uh, so it can't just be because of a speculative or circumstantial evidence. Um, and secondly, the it, well, it it, it implicitly. Uh, correctly interpreted would result that if somebody started making a wrong allegation, that person then could be executed for having caused the murder of the um, <clears throat> of the innocent person. So, uh, I said, but further than that, the uh, the advent of uh, of fingerprinting, DNA evidence has reduced that risk of um, of something happening incorrectly uh, and strengthened the level of evidence. Um, but yes, there is still a fragment of a possibility that somebody. Uh, could be, despite all of that, wrongfully uh, convicted, and I think we've we've got to take that risk, and uh, that person can be be vindicated um, on Judgment Day in heaven as an innocent person. What? Oh, come on, Philip. I mean, that is ridiculous. I'm always embarrassed for you for making that point. So if someone is killed and their death is now irreversible and was wrongful, oh, well, they can look forward uh, to, I don't know, what, getting a little bit of a slap on the back and an askis when they get to heaven? Is that the argument? Um, we've uh, well, you've got the case example that uh, J- you know Jesus himself was a wrongful conviction, didn't result in the church arguing in favour of abolishing the death penalty. Um, <clears throat> but uh, look, that's a there is that uh, there's always that fragment of a of a possibility. But I think that it, as science has improved, it's reduced that risk. Yeah, but the um, difference is, but- if I'm wrongfully convicted right now of theft. At least, I don't know, we can find someone at the Wits Justice Project to be dedicated to my claims and letters. I'm writing them from prison, and in 10 years' time, I'm on the Reedy Club show pouring my heart out about the wrongful conviction. That doesn't exist if I'm already dead and, you know, de- decapitated. So it doesn't seem to me like you're taking seriously that particular argument, Philip. No, look, I'm saying that I'm putting a rebuttal argument, but I'm leaving open the possibility that there might be a fraction, uh, still a fraction of risk there. Mm. I'd also like to respond to some of the previous arguments that were made, uh, which is that, firstly, in terms of the issue of race... Okay, let me just uh, bring in Pierre there, just for balance, and then I'm going to give you a final bite of the cherry. Pierre, one of the issues that that I did find compelling, and I... And I really think it's important to take seriously is the context. The truth of the matter is that there is racial and socioeconomically Mm -hmm. skewed levels of convictions in crime in general. Uh, Tell us a little bit about why that concerns you as another leg of why you don't support the death penalty. Yes. So if you're going, I think that it's very important to have a system that is fair. Um, We all know that our criminal justice system is not as fair as it should be. If you have money, um, if you have social power and so forth, the chances of you getting a, a, a lower sentence is, is much higher. So that, where you're going to have something like the death penalty, which is irrevocable, it seems to me there is a big moral and also constitutional issue involved that you are building into the system uh, inherent and problematic uh, different treatment for people uh, which often will be based on race. So I agree with your caller, David, that there's one of the big problems in South Africa with the death penalty, with a country that is so unequal, unsustainably unequal, is exactly that the disproportionate number of people who are going to be p- uh, punished with the death penalty will be black, um, not only for many different reasons, including the fact that people who are poor and that they are disproportionately black cannot have the same legal representation that will pr- protect the accused person and the convicted person from being mm. subject to the death penalty. Philip, how do you respond to the socioeconomic context? I mean, it's both poor people, and in this country that invariably also means poor black people, that will likely be uh, the largest number of folks that would have the death penalty meted out. A better case study for this is in America, where black Americans are in a statistical minority, but disproportionately are the ones finding themselves on death row. That's no coincidence, is it? Okay, well, firstly, we, I think we, in terms of the racial issue, firstly, the argument about the, uh, this, uh, there's been an attempt to kind of link the death penalty with apartheid and such like, and I, I would uh, disagree with that. Firstly, the courts are much now, now much more representative of the population, so the risk of that uh, risk of bias from the race of the judge is that much less. 
then further, the, there's been uh, the African uh, governments before colonialism had the death penalty. There's many other countries in the world which are nothing to do with the particular, our race group which have the death penalty. Um, we, uh, Japan has the death penalty. Other parts of Africa have the death penalty. And all, all races in South Africa agree by about a, two, uh, a three out of four majority, that is a 75% majority, that they want the death penalty back. If you take out neutral people, it actually becomes a four out of five majority, which is 80% majority. Um, so, look, we can talk about those American uh, statistics. Um, there's, uh, I, I don't believe that that interpretation that you've put is correct. I've, put, uh, I've looked into the situation. Which bit, um, Philip? Because the, the stats are accurate. It is disproportionately black Americans who are on death row. The only way you can avoid the fact that it's racialized is presumably if you imagine black Americans to be more prone towards criminality. Those statistics are publicly available, and there's issues that are, relate to the degeneration of the family in, uh, in certain population groups in America, and it, it links to the, the incidence of crimes on a whole lot of uh, on a broad range of issues. And I'd encourage you uh, to look at those statistics in a, in a, in a calm manner. Uh, yes, Philip, I have, and in a calm manner, I have come to the conclusion that black Americans are disproportionately on death row, unless the stats are wrong because there are invisible white men on death row as well that we're just not adding up. Okay, but that's it. It, it links to uh, to if you correlate it with the uh, the uh, the issue of of crime in general. Uh, it doesn't show a skew in relation to uh, to the death penalty or, uh, and such like. So you can look at look at those statistics from mm. that point of view. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Uh, Pierre, just in 30 seconds, Philip sneaked in an issue that I was going to set aside. So your comment on it, I'm going to restrict you to 30, to 30 seconds. There is sometimes a feeling in the public that when it comes to critical questions of policy, uh, that we don't test the public view enough. What do you what do you make of Philip's view that if we had to have a referendum, for example, the majority of people would support it, and that sentiment is never, never taken seriously enough by the Concord. Well, that is the nature of a constitutional democracy.